All right, folks, let's get started. Okay, so thank you for attending the C. Edwin Baker Lecture for Liberty, Equality, and Democracy. The West Virginia University of College of Law, with the support of the Edwin Baker family, have established the lecture to honor the legacy of the late C. Edwin Baker, the former, I have to get this right, Nicholas F. Galicchio, Professor of Law and Communication at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. C. Edwin Baker was a leading scholar of constitutional law, communication law, and free speech. He was considered one of the country's, and really still is, uh, foremost authorities on the First Amendment and mass media policy. His scholarship focused on the economics of the news business, political philosophy, and jurisprudential questions concerning egalitarian and libertarian bases of constitutional theory. He was a native of Madisonville, Kentucky. He received his bachelor's degree from Stanford, his law degree from a school called Yale, um, and he was a Law and Humanities Fellow at Harvard University. Professor Lafaso will introduce our speaker of the day. Um, and after the lecture today, there will be pizza in the hallway because we like the First Amendment and pizza here. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Blake. Um, welcome, everyone. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce you to Professor Marty Malin. But first, I want you to know that uh, and you did get his title right. Uh, Ed Baker was my con law professor. And Ed Baker was one of my favorite professors ever. And um, when he passed away early by going into diabetic shock and people mistaking it for a heart attack, which is obviously very, very sad, um, it was a great shock to all of us. He was only 60 years old. And to honor his memory, um, we, um, the family gave WVU some money so that we can bring um, top-notch scholars here to talk about important civil rights issues, in particular uh, free speech and um, equal protection. So this, this is obviously something very personal to me, and I'm always personally involved in, who, um, who the, uh, in the selection of the speaker. Therefore, it is truly a great pleasure and honor to introduce you to Professor Marty Malin. Professor Malin comes to us as the current chair of the Federal Impasses Panel. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that's part of a federal agency called the FLRA, and um, you have to have a presidential appointment to get that position. Um, he was appointed by President uh, Biden in August 2021. Professor Malin has had a long, auspicious career, which might be obvious by the fact that he's currently a presidential appointment appointee. He is currently the pr professor emeritus at Chicago Kent College of Law at the Illinois, uh, at, uh, um, at the Illinois in Institute of Technology, where he taught for 41 years, where he founded the Institute for Law and the Workplace and served as its director for 25 years. He joined the Chicago Ken faculty after clerking for US District Court Judge Robert DiMaggio sorry, in Detroit and having served on the faculty of The Ohio State University. A renowned scholar on the law governing the workplace, he has published more than 80 articles and seven books on labor law. Professor Malin has served as the National Chair of the Labor Relations and Employment Law Section of the AALS, um, Secretary of the ABA Section on Labor and Employment Law, and uh, Executive Committee Member of the Board of Governors of the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers, which is um, in many ways, I think, the most prestigious of all because in order to even be in the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers, you have to be nominated by peers who are on the opposite side that you normally take on issues. So you're, you're shown to be someone of, of great discernment. So that's something that I think is very important. I will say we also have in here another member of the College of Labor Employment Lawyers who is a good friend of, of Marty's. And uh, he's also a, a former 
a former um, chair of the Federal Services Impasse Panel, but appointed by President Trump and President uh, Bush, and that is Mark Carter. I bring this up because um, if you go back to President Bush, W. Bush, you have um, uh, Professor Malin here was, was actually, uh, sorry, let me get this straight. Um, Professor, pro sorry, Mark Carter was appointed by pre President Bush, and then Professor Malin was appointed by President Obama to serve on the Federal Services Impasse Panel, then reappointed again in 2014, and left in 2017, just in time for Mark Carter to take over as chair under the Trump administration. And so, and they are good friends. And I say that because many of my students are here and I want you to know how important it is for everyone, regardless of your political alignments or what party you're aligned with or who appoints you, that we in the legal community tend to actually get along with each other and how important that is to the practice of law. Um, lastly, I'd like to say that um, in 2016, uh, the ABA presented Professor Malin with a lifelong contributions, uh, sorry, achievement award for lifelong, lifetime contributions to the pu public sector labor law. Professor Malin has been a great mentor to me. He recently invited me to be on a, on, um, a book with him which was an incredible learning experience. He edited all my work, which was a very both learning and humbling experience. And so I owe him a great deal. I uh, like to introduce you now, and let's give a warm West Virginia welcome to Professor Marty Malin. Thank you, Professor LaFasso. Uh, one thing, Professor LaFasso neglected to mention when she was talking about the College of Labor Lawyers is she too is a fellow of the College of Labor and, Lawyer, Labor and Employment Lawyers. Um, I am just thrilled and deeply honored to present the Baker Lecture. Uh, indeed, when Professor LaFasso invited me and shared with me who the prior lecturers had been, I felt an attack of imposter syndrome. <laughs> Um, I want to thank everyone here at West Virginia University for the amazing hospitality you have shown me, and Professor LaFasso and the administrative staff for all the logistics that have made everything run so smoothly. And special thanks to Professor LaFasso. This talk had its origins shortly after the Supreme Court last term decided the case of Kennedy versus Bremen School District, which is the case of the assistant football coach who wanted to pray at the 50-yard line right after the football games. It's a high school football coach. Um, and, uh, it, it, and the, uh, that decision provoked a lot of discussion amongst constitutional law scholars over the relationship between the free exercise and establishment clauses of the First Amendment. But I reacted not like a constitutional law scholar, which I am not, but like the labor law scholar that I claim to be. And to me, the majority in that case privileged an act of aggravated gross insubordination by a subordinate employee who deserved to lose his job. <laughs> and left public employers in untenable positions when it comes to human resources management. And I ranted about that in an email to my public sector employment casebook co-authors, and everybody responded, yeah, you're really on to something. And I responded, anybody want to work with me on this? And to my deep delight, Professor LaFasso said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so what I'm presenting today is actually um, the product of Professor LaFasso's intellectual effort as well as my intellectual effort. So it's so, so really a joint product, a, a collaboration. So, um, so how do you turn, because the, the Baker Lecture has always been focused on constitutional law, so how do you turn a constitutional law lecture into a labor law lecture? 
very easy. <laughs> Whenever a unit of government is the employer, every human resource decision potentially triggers constitutional scrutiny because there's state action present, as opposed to when the employer is a private entity. Uh, so how do you deal with that? Whoops, here's the clicker. So traditionally, the courts dealt with it with what became known as the right, the right privilege distinction. That is, uh, you may have had a right of free speech, but public employment was considered a privilege. Um, and the classic articulation of the right privilege distinction came from Oliver Wendell Holmes when he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. And that's up on the screen. The petitioner may have a constitutional right to talk politics, but he has no constitutional right to be a policeman. There are few employments for hire in which the servant does not agree to suspend his constitutional rights of free speech as well as of idleness by the implied terms of his contract. The servant cannot complain as he takes the employment on the terms which are offered to him. Now, the right privilege distinction started to erode in the early 1960s. Excuse me. Initially, it eroded in Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination cases and in First Amendment loyalty cases. Um, and it was totally blown apart in 1968 in the decision of Pickering versus the Board of Education of uh, the Kane County School District in my home state of Illinois. So uh, in this case, Pickering wrote a letter to the editor of his local newspaper. Remember that? <laughs> Some of us are old enough to remember that, um, remember local newspapers, in which he cri criticized the Board of Education's spending priorities as between athletics and academics. And he did this in the context of a campaign to approve a tax increase. Um, he was fired uh, for disloyalty. The Illinois courts upheld his termination, again, focusing on the right privilege distinction, saying no First Amendment violation at all. But the Supreme Court reversed. And the court wrote, to the extent that the Illinois Supreme Court's opinion may be read to suggest that teachers may constitutionally be compelled to relinquish the First Amendment rights they would otherwise enjoy as citizens to comment on matters of public concern, the, um, of public interest, excuse me, in connection with the operation of the public schools in which they work. It proceeds on a premise that has been unequivocally rejected in prior decisions of this court. At the same time, it cannot be gainsaid that the state has interests as, as an employer in regulating the speech of its employees that differ significantly from those it possesses in connection with regulation of the speech of the citizenry in general. The problem in any case is to arrive at a balance between the interests of the teacher as a citizen in commenting upon matters of public concern and the interests of the state as an employer in promoting the efficiency of the public services it performs uh, through its employees. So move forward from 1968, 15 years to 1983, to the next major Supreme Court decision uh, in this area, uh, and that's Connick v. Myers. And uh, oops, there we go. Uh, so and Connick, by the way, uh, is Harry Connick Sr., uh, the father of the Connick we all know, Harry Connick Jr. But Harry Connick Sr was the district attorney of Orleans Parish right? uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana. Myers was an assistant DA, and she was upset over a job transfer that was imposed upon her. And so she took a, a survey of her fellow assistant DAs. Uh, and she surveyed her colleagues about transfers, transfer policy, uh, rumor mills, and office morale communications to the staff, whether a grievance procedure was needed, and whether they felt pressured to work in political campaigns. Connick fired her, and she sued. And the lower courts 
held that uh, she had a cause of action, applying Pickering. Uh, but the Supreme Court reversed in a divided opinion. And the court said public employee speech is constitutionally protected against adverse employment action only when the speech is on a matter of public concern, as opposed to being protected against other actions of the government. Um, the court distinguished a discharge from public employment from, for example, a libel lawsuit. Um, and when speech is on a matter of public concern, the court must balance the employee's interest in speaking against the employer's interest in managing its workforce. So the court said all of the aspects of Meyer's questionnaire, except for one, were not speech on matters of public concern. They were all about working conditions. They were all about her private grievances uh, confined to the workplace. The one aspect of her, so they were not protected against adverse employment act, action, but the one aspect of her survey that was on a matter of concern, public concern was the question about did you feel, do you feel pressured to work in political campaigns? And so the court said when speech is on a matter of public concern, we have to balance, the, just like we said in Pickering, the employee's interests against the employer's managerial interests. But the court said we do so with a healthy deference to the managerial judgments of the employer. When close working relationships are essential to fulfilling public responsibilities, a wide range of deference to the employer's judgment is appropriate. Now, Justice Brennan dissented. In his view, all of Meyer's questionnaire was on a matter of public concern and should have been subject to the balancing test. He wrote that Meyer's questionnaire addressed matters of public concern that could reasonably be expected to be of interest to persons seeking to develop informed opinions about the manner in which the Orleans Parish District Attorney and elected official charged with managing a vital government agency discharges his responsibilities. Now, the third, um, and keep Brennan's dissent in mind because we're going to come back to it. So the third major Supreme Court decision in this area is Garcetti versus Sabalas, right? Uh, Garcetti is Gil Garcetti, the district attorney for Los Angeles County. Um, Sabalos was a calendar deputy. I'm not sure what that means, uh, but he was a deputy district attorney uh, in the office. And in his role as a calendar deputy, defense counsel in one particular case came to him and asked him to review a search warrant. And this, this was just a typical uh, event in the life of a calendar deputy. And so he did his job. He reviewed the search warrant, reviewed the affidavit that was provided by the um, sheriff's dep dep deputy in support of the search warrant, and investigated and concluded there were serious inaccuracies in the affidavit, perhaps bordering on perjury. Um, he wrote, he, continuing to do his job, he wrote a disposition memo summarizing all of this and recommending to his superiors that the evidence would likely be suppressed and they should stop throwing good money after bad and just dismiss the charges against the defendant. Well, his supervisor disagreed. Uh, and in fact, the case went forward and it went to a hearing on a motion to suppress and the judge uh, also disagreed and denied the motion to suppress. Well, Sabalos claimed that after that, he experienced retaliation in terms of promotion denials and being transferred to less desirable positions and things of that sort for his, in retaliation for writing that disposition memo, and he sued, and the lower courts agreed with him that he had a claim. But the Supreme Court reversed, and the court said to be protected against adverse employment action, an employee must be speaking as, an, as a citizen and not as an employee. And here, Sabalos was clearly speaking as an employee, and therefore he had no constitutional protection against adverse employment action. 
So where are we coming up to a few years ago? You had for a public employee to have a claim, uh, a constitutional claim about adverse employment action, the employee must be speaking as a citizen, not as, a, as an employee. The uh, public employee must be speaking on a matter of public concern, and then the court does this balancing between the employee's free speech interests and the employer's managerial interests. What do the lower courts do with that? Well, the lower courts read Garcetti very, very broadly. For example, the Second Circuit in 2010 said, well, what Garcetti really did was it placed a new burden on an employee plaintiff to prove as an element that the employee was speaking as a citizen. And in order to prove that, the employee had to show some citizen analog to the employee's speech. But for some courts, that wasn't enough. So a district court in Louisiana held an employee was not protected when the employee alleged that he was retaliated against because of a speech he gave at a Toastmasters Club meeting. And, uh, and the reason this was held not to be speech as a citizen was because obtaining a competent Toastmasters designation was a requirement to be considered for promotion. It gets worse. Uh, <laughs> in, in this Ford case, the, um, the, a Chicago police officer complained to the Police Department Internal Affairs Division and the Independent Police Review Authority, avenues that were open to any resident of the city of Chicago, and the complaint was about other police officers who were mistreating his son. Um, and the Seventh Circuit said this was not protected because although he was using a forum that was open to all citizens, every police officer has a duty to report police misconduct. Therefore, he was speaking as an employee under Garcetti. Supreme Court in 2014 tried to cut back on that in Lane versus Franks. In that case, uh, an administrator at a community college in Alabama had a member of the state legislature who was a ghost payroller, <laughs> uh, was on the payroll, performed absolutely no duties. And this administrator opposed this, told the legislator, you know, you need to do your job, <laughs> whatever your job is. Uh, and tried to terminate the legislator. Uh, well, eventually, the local US attorney, maybe tipped off by this administrator, uh, intervened, and this legislator was indicted and ultimately convicted. Um, and this administrator testified both to the grand jury and in the, in the trial, uh, and was fired. <laughs> and the lower courts said, you were just doing your job, so you were not protected under Garcetti, the Supreme Court reversed. No, and the court said no, there was nothing in this administrator's job responsibilities that required him to testify before a grand jury, to testify in, in the criminal trial. That was a duty that every citizen has, and, and so therefore reversed. And initially thought, well, that's gonna cut back on the wide uh, range of employee speech that the lower courts were uh, saying was covered by Garcetti. But notice that Chicago Police Department case came three years later in 2017. So it really did not have that effect. So let's move forward now. Um, so once we get past that hurdle and show that it is speech as an employee, we have to apply Connick and Pickering. And in applying Connick and Pickering, courts generally held that speech about working conditions was not speech on a matter of public concern. Right? That was totally consistent with what the Supreme Court did in Connick. Murf Murray versus Gardner is a good example of this. Here, an FBI agent uh, criticized the FBI's plan to implement a furlough. The plan was to implement that furlough by lottery. <laughs> And the FBI agent said, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and uh, claimed he was retaliated against. And the DC Circuit said, that was not speech on a matter of public concern. The furlough plan was purely a labor relations matter. 
Similarly, Dwyer versus Smith, police officer criticized conditions at the firing range, and the Fourth Circuit said that's not speech on a matter of public concern because it was related to her personal grievances over shotgun qualifying. Ron versus Drake Center is a pretty extreme example. There, a nurse was chair of a citizen's organization. And in that capacity, she criticized hospital administration. And the Sixth Circuit said that's not speech on a matter of public concern because it related primarily to work rules with which the nurse disagreed. And in applying the balancing test, when the speech was on a matter of public concern, courts tended to defer to the employer's <coughs> managerial judgments. And uh, a couple of examples here, Lewis versus Cowan, Second Circuit decision. Lewis was the chief of the Connecticut State Lottery Unit, and he was terminated, he alleged, because he refused to advocate for an outside contractor's plan to change the way the lottery was operated. The outside contractor recommended having more numbers in order to win because that would generate fewer, vic fewer wins, which would generate higher prize, uh, prize amounts, which would generate more people buying lottery tickets and greater revenue. And uh, the uh, court upheld the state's termination of this individual, saying predictions of disruption were not unreasonable and there was no need to prove any actual disruption to the uh, lottery unit's operations. Similarly, uh, Weikarding versus Regal uh, upheld the termination of an Illinois corrections sergeant after the sergeant participated in a Ku Klux Klan rally. Again, the sergeant argued there was no evidence that his First Amendment protected activity uh, as odious as we would think it was, disrupted the operation of the correction center. And the Seventh Circuit said the warden need not wait until a riot breaks out to quell a dangerous situation. Again, deferring to the warden's judgment. And indeed, the, the Supreme Court itself in 1994 observed, we have consistently given greater deference to government predictions of harm used to justify restriction of employee speech than to predictions of harm used to justify restrictions on the speech of the public as large. We have given substantial weight to government employers' reasonable predictions of disruption, even when the speech involved is on a matter of public concern, and even though when the government is acting as sovereign, our review of legislative predictions of harm is considerably less deferential. So what's been happening lately? Well, 2018, we get the Supreme's decision in Janus versus AFSCME, Council 31. And in Janus, the collective bargaining agreement required that employees represented by the union, as represented in collective bargaining with the state of Illinois, uh, who were not members of the union, had to pay a fee to the union uh, representing their pro rata share of the cost of their representation, negotiating contract, processing grievances, and the like. Um, the Supreme Court had upheld the constitutionality of such agency shop or fair share fees in 1977 in a case called Abood versus Detroit Board of Education. But in Janus, the Supreme Court overruled Abood uh, and subjected the arrangement to exacting scrutiny and held that it failed to meet that standard. The court said, now, now why is Janus relevant to this? Well, the extraction of agency fees affects the non-member as an employee, not as a citizen. It's more analogous, by analogy to Garcetti, it is more like um, a denial of a promotion than it is a libel suit, for example. And so under Garcetti, one would think that the non-member had no First Amendment protection against that extraction. But not to Justice Alito. The court said, when an employee speaks in the course of performing the employee's job responsibilities, the employee is effectively the employer's spokesperson. The employee's words are truly the words of the employer. Here, Janice is forced to subsidize the speech of the union to the employer. So Garcetti does not apply. More from Janice. So, 
Under Connick, right, employee speech is protected against adverse employment action only when it's on a matter of public concern. Right? Here, Janice was compelled to subsidize speech with respect to wages and working conditions. And those were generally held by the lower courts and indeed by the court in Connick not to be matters of public concern. But not to Justice Alito. Justice Alito said, Connick concern restrictions on speech. This is a case of compelled speech. Janice was compelled to subsidize the union speech. And compelled speech is different from restrictions on speech. When a public employee does not public employer does not simply restrict <clears throat> potentially disruptive speech, but commands that its employees mouth a message on its own behalf, the calculus is very different. But Justice Alito said, even if we're going to apply Pickering and Connick, the speech Janice was compelled to subsidize was speech on matters of public concern. These included wages and their impact on the employer's budget, public employee pensions, pay based on length of service or some measure of merit, transfer policies. Remember, that was one of the subjects of Meyer's questionnaire that the court said was not protected because it was not on a matter of public concern, and job security. You could almost envision you know, Justice Brennan looking down from, from heaven, clapping, applauding that, because that's exactly what he was saying in his, in his dissent in Connick. And the court showed absolutely no deference to the employer, the state of Illinois' judgment that agency fees for the positive labor relations. Instead, that judgment was subject to exacting scrutiny based on the court's own analysis of that judgment. And in another law review article called After Janice that I collaborated with Professor Catherine Fisk of Berkeley on, published in the California Law Review, I think we do a pretty good job of showing the flaws in the court's analysis of that judgment. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Now we get to Kennedy versus Brennan's, Bremen School District. So uh, Kennedy was an assistant high school football coach. He prayed at the 50-yard line at the end of the game. He also led pre- and post-game prayers in the locker room. The school district ordered him to keep his religious activities non-demonstrative when students were present. Initially, Kennedy complied. He stopped the locker room activities and he prayed on the field only after the stadium had emptied. But then uh, Kennedy got a lawyer, uh, <laughs> and his lawyer wrote the school district saying that Kennedy was going to resume his 50-yard line prayers at the conclusion of the next game because his coaching responsibilities had ceased at that point. His prayers were private speech. Kennedy also doubled down. He embarked on a social media campaign publicizing his intent to resume his 50-yard line prayers. And you can, you know, you can, it's no surprise what happened next. Next game, he goes to the 50-yard line at the conclusion of the game, kneels in prayer, and a large group from the stands rush the field, knocking over band members and cheerleaders to join him in prayer. The district directed Kennedy to cease and advised that his coaching responsibilities continued until the players were released to their parents, offered accommodations to Kennedy, and invited Kennedy to participate in an interactive process to find a mutually acceptable accommodation. Kennedy snubbed that invitation um, and continued his 50-yard line prayers at the next two games. The district put him on paid administrative leave for the rest of the season. When his contract expired at the rest of the season, he did not seek renewal. Instead, he sued, claiming his rights under the free exercise and free speech clauses were violated. Now, when I first read the background facts to this case, I thought, there's something wrong with this picture. How does Kennedy even have standing to bring this lawsuit? He did not ask to be renewed. He effectively resigned. <laughs> Moreover, he didn't lose any money. He was never terminated. He was placed on paid administrative leave, but that did not seem to concern the court. Um, so the court did not apply 
Pickering and Connick to his free exercise claim. Instead, the court found that the district had discriminated against Kennedy by forbidding his post-game activity because it was religious, while allowing other coaches to brief briefly visit friends in the stands and use their cell phones. Um, court never explained how engaging in a public social media campaign to, to create a spectacle that included, that endangered the safety of band members and cheerleaders was comparable to looking at your cell phone <laughs> or saying hello to a friend in the stands. Um, indeed, the court's majority opinion didn't even acknowledge the public spectacle or the danger posed to band members and cheerleaders. The court rejected the school district's argument that allowing Kennedy to proceed with public display would violate the Establishment Clause. And that, of course, is the part of the opinion that's gotten most of the attention. The court said Garcetti did not apply to Kennedy's free speech claim because his praying was not speaking as the government. Regarding, uh, regardless of whether strict scrutiny or conic balancing applied to Kennedy's free speech claim, Kennedy should win. It offered no deference to the school district's managerial judgment that allowing Kennedy to conduct a public display at the center of the field immediately after the game could coerce players into similar activity. Remember, these are teenagers. These are high school football players. The court picked apart the district's evidence, and that evidence included expressions of concern the district had received from parents. The court labeled that evidence hearsay and speculated that they may have been influenced by the prior locker room prayers, which Kennedy had since ceased. I'm sorry, I should have clicked before I spoke that. <laughs> so uh, what has been the impact of Janice and Kennedy on public employer managerial authority? Garcetti has essentially been limited to its facts. So in order for the employee's speech to be considered speech as an employee, it must occur during the employee's performance of actual job duties, which is what Sabalos was doing when he wrote his, uh, his disposition memo. Uh, I actually applaud that. When, when the Garcetti decision first came down, most academics were up in arms about it. This was terrible. I was kind of the lone wolf saying, no, this is absolutely right. Because an employer has to be able to evaluate an employee's job performance. And when an employee's job performance includes speech, they have to be able to evaluate that speech and to reward positive job performance and correct negative job performance. But it was the lower courts that blew it up way out of proportion. And so the... Um, the court and Janice and Kennedy have now brought it back to where it belongs. Uh, I don't see that as impeding employer managerial authority at all. The court said Pickering and Connick do not apply to claims of compelled speech, which are now subject to exacting scrutiny. That's Janice, right? So well, we don't get very many claims of compelled speech in public sector employment but Lewis V. Cowan, I would submit, now comes out, that's the discharge lottery chief, now comes out the, uh, the other way. Because now we're not deferring to the judgment of, of uh, Lewis's superiors, excuse me, of Cowan's, yeah, Lewis's superiors, he was the plaintiff. We are, def we are, say, we, we are saying we're going to submit that judgment to exacting scrutiny, and it, there's no way it could, it could pass that test because all they had to do was send someone else to argue in favor of the contractor's proposal to restructure the lottery. The court also, in Kennedy, said Pickering and Connick test does not apply to claims of the free exercise of religion. They are subject to strict scrutiny. So let's take a look at free exercise claims after Kennedy. Example, what if a high school, t high school teachers on their own time and for no compensation, organize voluntary after-school ACT and SAT uh, prep sessions. School administration allows them to use classrooms. One teacher begins each session with a prayer for success on the tests. 
The teacher tells the students they're free to participate or not and may attend a different teacher's prep session if they wish. The administration directs the teacher to confine herself or himself to silent prayer not shared with the students. That sounds like a pretty reasonable judgment, right? Managerial judgment. Indeed, there would seem to be a reasonable concern that what the teacher was doing might undermine the teacher's effectiveness in the classroom. Although this is on the teacher's own time, there's a clear nexus to the teacher's employment. And there's certainly a reasonable concern that you know, parents and students will be worried that they will be, that the students will be discriminated against in the teacher's own classes if they don't conform to the teacher's religious beliefs. But I should submit under Kennedy, this goes down. There, there's the, the, the courts are very likely to find a free exercise violation. Um, and, and indeed, in, in, in some respects, it's a stronger case for a free exercise violation because it's occurring on the teacher's own time, whereas Kennedy was still on the clock when Kennedy knelt down and prayed at the 50-yard line. Let's take another example. Teachers decorate their desks with family pictures, mementos from trips, other personal items. One teacher displays a picture of Jesus with a quote from the Bible on, at, at the teacher's desk. Over the course of the day, many students interact with the teacher at the teacher's desk principal instructs the teacher to remove the Jesus picture in the Bible quote. Once again, that would seem to be a reasonable managerial direction. Huh? We don't want that distracting the students when they come up to, to meet with you at your desk. It'd be the same thing if you had a pornographic picture up there, oh, or even a picture showing a lot of skin, even though you know, relevant parts are sufficiently covered that we wouldn't consider it pornographic. But I think to the majority in Kennedy versus Bremen School District, this is discriminating on the teacher, against the teacher on the basis of religion and must be subject to strict scrutiny and fails that test. Wilson versus US Communications was a 1995 Eighth Circuit decision. Now, that was a case where uh, that was decided under Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Obviously, U.S. West is not a public employer, uh, so the Constitution, there's no state action. Uh, but in that case, we had an employee who, had, uh, who said that she had made a promise to God to be a living witness and to wear an anti-abortion button until abortion became a thing of the past. And the problem with her button was it contained a picture of an 18 to 20 week old fetus. And um, quite a few of her coworkers were very upset, not by the anti-abortion message, but by having to see this picture of this aborted fetus. Uh, indeed, there was at least one coworker who had had a miscarriage sometime earlier and it's just triggered, it was a trigger for her. So US West offered her various accommodations, including that she could wear the button at her cubicle but not wear it when she walked around the office. She could wear any other anti-abortion button at all times as long as it didn't contain that picture. Um, but uh, she claimed a violation of Title VII. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act requires um, employers to reasonably accommodate employees' religious practices and beliefs, uh, and, un, unless they impose undue hardship on the employer. And she argued um, to, the, um, to the Eighth Circuit that the employer should have simply told her coworkers to ignore the button and just go about doing their jobs. Well, the Eighth Circuit rejected that because the law at the time and the law still today, although it's probably about to change and the court's hearing oral argument in a case to reconsider this standard next week, um, is that undue hardship under the religion clause of Title VII uh, is anything more than de minimis cost. Um, and so the court had no problem saying this was undue hardship and, and her Title VII claim failed. But what if she's a public employee? 
Now we have a claim under the free exercise clause. Um, and I'm not sure how it comes out, but I think there's a really good chance she wins uh, after, after, Brem, um, after Kennedy versus Bremen School District. And now I don't have this on the slide because this just came down on Friday. Decision of the Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit in a case called Klug, K-L-U-G-E versus Brownsburg Community School Corporation. The citation is 2023 Westlaw 2821071. It's a decision of the Seventh Circuit issued April 7th. And in this case, again, it was although this was a public employer, the case was brought and decided under Title VII. The school district required teachers to, and this is a high school, to uh, call students by their names that were registered in the school's official database. And that included uh, names that were different from the names assigned at birth uh, of students who were transgender. And Klug, for religious reasons, refused to call transgender students by names that were inconsistent with their sex as recorded at birth. Um, and initially, the school district accommodated Klug by allowing him to call all students by their last names. And they also agreed, Klug was the orchestra teacher, and they also agreed that he would explain to the students that the orchestra was a team, just like the athletic teams. And the athletic coaches always called the students just by their last names, and he was gonna do the same thing to emphasize the team aspect of the orchestra. Um, but the principal got all sorts of complaints, uh, particularly from parents of transgender students. Um, you know, everybody saw through the ruse about we're a team, we're gonna treat you like the sports teams are treated. Um, and so the school district told Krug at the end of this school year, you have to stop doing this. Starting next school year, you have to call students by their official names. Um, the Seventh Circuit, in a 2-1 decision, held that, um, the, the, that the school district had established undue hardship. Uh, if, it, you know, because Kluke, Kluke said, no, I should just be able to call students by their last names, uh, the, the original accommodation. I'm happy with that. It, it, it satisfies my religious beliefs. Um, and the, the two-judge majority at the Seventh Circuit said, no, the school district has shown more than de minimis cost um, of allowing you to continue to call students by their, by their last names. The dissenting judge said, uh, no, I'm not exactly sure that um, complaints of offense amount to more than de minimis costs under Title VII, I would find a Title VII violation. Now, if the case were brought under the free exercise clause after Kennedy, there's no question that there's a violation here. Right? The court in Kennedy did not apply Garcetti, even consider the application of Garcetti to a free exercise clause. Yet this would seem to call out for Garcetti to apply because we're talking about what the teacher is calling the students in the course of performing the teacher's duties. That teacher is speaking as an agent of the school district. This is employer speech. And under Garcetti, the employer can regulate it as opposed to free speech concerns. But what about free exercise concerns? I think the court that decided Kennedy would say, nope, <laughs> no, there's a free exercise violation. The Connick Pickering framework also has undergone major changes. A significant expansion of speech on a matter of public concern. So Connick itself, I think, now comes out the other way. You know, trans what the, the survey about transfer policies under Janus now is speech on a matter of public concern. So does Murray versus Gardner, the FBI agent's criticism of how agents were selected for furlough. Only speech related to specific working conditions of a specific employee would appear to be excluded. Furthermore, uh, and this, and I don't think that expansion is necessarily a bad thing for public employers as long as the balancing test is applied properly. 
but now there is little if any deference to employer managerial judgments. Instead, those judgments are likely to be picked apart and rejected as they were in Kennedy. Kennedy sanctioned blatant insubordination aggravated by making a public spectacle that resulted in band members and cheerleaders being overrun, and further aggravated by Kennedy snubbing his employer's offer of an interactive process to agree on accommodations. We used to say the general rule is obey now and grieve later, even if the employer's directive turns out to be illegal, the employee is expected to obey it and is subject to discipline for insubordination unless it poses a, a direct threat to health or safety. Under Kennedy, I suggest that has now been replaced by defy now and sue. Um, I suspect that Weikerding, the case of the correction sergeant who went to the Ku Klux Klan rally comes out the other way, absent any evidence of actual disruption in the prison. Now the warden does have to wait until a riot breaks out. And then we have a case called Dodge versus Evergreen School District. Um, so Dodge decision in the Ninth Circuit doesn't cite Kennedy, but it could have. So in Dodge, you had a teacher who coming to a beginning of the semester, the week before the semester in service for all teachers, wore a MAGA hat. And the uh, principal asked the teacher not to bring the MAGA hat because it was a distraction. Um, the Ninth Circuit said that violated the teacher's First Amendment rights. And the, uh, because there was no showing of actual disruption to the teacher in services. Now, that, I don't rely on that decision for the actual case because there was actually some pretty strong evidence in that case that the principal engaged in viewpoint discrimination. If that teacher had worn some pro-Biden paraphernalia, there would not have been a directive not to bring it to the, uh, there was pretty strong evidence, there would not have been a directive not to bring it to the, uh, to, to the um, in-service. And so if you view it as viewpoint discrimination, I think it comes out the right way. But I think under Kennedy, uh, and you, you now have to show actual disruption, even if it was a viewpoint neutral directive. If the, if the principal had directed teachers, when you come to the in-service, we don't want any political ideological paraphernalia on display. Why? Because in this polarized political climate in which we live, we don't want those distractions from the reason why you're there, and that is to get the in-service training in preparation for the start of the school year. I fear right now that judgment would not be deferred to, and there would have to be a showing of actual, um, of, of actual disruption. Um, so what's my bottom line? There's been a substantial erosion of employer human resource authority, which poses a serious challenge for public employers to manage their workforces. I have some colleagues who say, this Supreme Court is very pro-employer, and I said, absolutely not. <laughs> um, this is great news for extremist activists on the left and the right, but I suggest it's bad news for everyone else. Thank you for your indulgence. <laughs> I'm not sure we're gonna have time for questions, but I do want to, maybe we could take one question. But before that, I just wanna thank a few people. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank the um, Labor Law Society. Labor Law Society did a lot of administrative work here. There's um, Steve Smith, where's Carly Desario, Eli Leggett, okay, and others. So I just wanna thank them. Um, I also wanna thank, where's Cameron Kiner? Cameron did, you could see how well researched this is. Well, Cameron did a lot of the research. So we only started working on this, what, like in October maybe? And um, it's, you can see there's, it's bringing together many different strands of law, also historical perspectives on the law. It just takes a lot of work to do that. Uh, obviously, we want to thank the dean and the associate dean um, for everything. We want to thank Mark Carter for um, coming to this. And uh, I'm sure I forgot other people, but all the invisible workers that are here, uh, that are here and have helped, like Ken, who 
it was like he's actually very visible, but um, but he doesn't always get thanked for what he does. Um, Lisa Brunoli and many others, uh, Samantha. There's just so many people to thank. Maybe we have time for one question. If anyone wants to ask a question, or do you want pizza? Which do you prefer? There's no way I could ever compete with pizza. Wait, wait, John, do you have a question? Well, I would prefer students, but I'll ask a question if there's. If there's I think we've got a couple minutes for one or two. Okay, great. And then Jordan has a question also. <laughs> All right, we'll do Jordan's next. Jordan, is relevant? Yeah, it's relevant. Yeah. <laughs> How about labor law? <laughs> labor law. Um, so my question is, uh, symbols obviously mean something, and. A lot of times, symbols that mean something 50 years ago mean something different today. For example, uh, like the upside down cross is a symbol of St. Peter, but in other cultures, it's a symbol of the demon, something like that. How would a court decide, or how would, a, how would the court today rule on something that a symbol that somebody means personally to them might mean something different to somebody else? That's what I'm trying, I'm, I'm just trying to think like, well, not everything means everything to everybody, but I guess I just, uh, that's kind of my question, so. Yeah, so um, if it arises in the context of an adverse employment action, so if an employee is wearing that symbol to work and is directed not to wear it, um, like the employee with the picture of the 20-week-old aborted fetus. Um, what, uh, yeah, and, and then is disciplined when the employee continues to wear it. Um, I think we go through the, um, you know, the, and, and this is a public employer. I, I think we go through the Pickering Conic analysis. You know, the um, first of all, is the the wearing of that symbol speech on a matter of public concern. And I think it would depend on what the symbol is, right? And, and it may get into a question of how do we interpret the symbol, which I think may be what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it'd be an interesting question of, of whether that would be an issue for the court or an issue for a jury, for example. I mean, the obvious, you know, the MAGA hat, that's a symbol that's speech on a matter of public concern, right? Uh, but but. You know, some of these other things, that's a good question. Yeah, like oh. a rainbow, like a rainbow, for example, that's a symbol of LGBTQ. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that, that's where the rubber would hit the road is on the question of whether this was speech on a matter of public concern. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in the hypothetical you gave about the after school teacher teaching the S or ACT, right. um, do you think that the court would maybe consider that that wouldn't be permissible because of coercion? So like, for example, like in town of Greece, they say to look to history and then you look to whether the action is coercive. However, in Kennedy, they were kind of arguing that it wasn't coercive because the students were able to come to the coach themselves. It wasn't that they were, and you couldn't really hear the prayer unless you were standing like a couple of feet away from him versus the after school where they're basically preaching the prayer to a class of children. Yeah, I, one of the problems with the Kennedy decision is the, the court majority just picked the facts that it wanted to use, right? Uh, and ignored the facts that contradicted where it was going. You know, they, Ignored the public spectacle of it. Ignored the, um, ignored the the uh, you know the 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 danger right to to the cheerleaders and the band members and the like. Um, but I think the 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 other um, you know the court also just totally picked apart the school district's judgment that this could be coercive of the football players. Even though parents themselves were saying, my kid is worried that if my kid doesn't pray with the football coach, my kid is not gonna get playing time. You know? and, and the court just totally picked that apart. 
Um, and, and I would fear in the hypothetical that, that, that uh, at least the Kennedy court would do the same thing to any concern, uh, any managerial judgment that the school district made that this could be coercive to students, saying, no, the teacher said, come or not, yeah? And totally ignoring you know, the, the power and influence that a teacher has over a teacher's students. Yeah. Wait for the microphone, so. Oh. <laughs> I don't really need it, but okay. Well, yeah, but people uh, who uh, might be watching this, the oh, live okay. stream will not hear you without enough. the microphone. <laughs> so, um, and my daughters are watching the live stream. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, well, well for, for your daughters then. Um, um, the, um, so so a, lot of prop, a lot of dicey things in Kennedy versus Crimson, in my view. I haven't really looked at it through this angle or vision that you're presenting, so it's interesting. I guess my question is, is this. Um, if I would imagine that if the majority of the court were here listening to this, to your talk, I suspect they might say something like this. I think they would say, you know, these other cases like, like the Pickering Connick line are talking about the need of the public manager to be able to kind of keep the workplace working smoothly. And I suspect what they would say about a case like Kennedy is they would say that's not really yeah. like keeping the workplace working smoothly is not the concern. The concern is we're afraid we're going to get sued by the ACLU or the Americans United or something, and we're trying to put the kibosh on the football coach for that reason. And so when the court says, oh, um, perhaps you hadn't noticed, but we already overruled these establishment of false cases that we hadn't yet actually overruled, um, that eliminates your fear of litigation, and therefore this is all kind of pointless. So I think they would say yeah. this was never about the same kind of thing, and they might say, in, and if you look at it that way, it's not as clear how much it impacts the more general line of sort of public employee managerial discretion cases that you're talking about. So I, I suspect they might sort of have that reaction, and I'm wondering what your reaction to that would be. Yeah, so hindsight is always 2020, you know, and looking back on it, I think there may have been a tactical error by the school district's lawyers yes. in, in relying almost exclusively on the concern about violating the Establishment Clause to, as, their, as their compelling governmental interests. Um, I, I, but I'm not sure the case would come out any differently had the school district emphasized the, you know, the public safety concerns, uh, the other concerns you know, that you know, were legitimately there, the need to, you know, the, the, and, the, and the need to manage their workforce and the deliberate aggravated act of insubordination that, that Kennedy engaged in. Moreover, I think there's an argument to be made that the public employer's concern about how, remember the, 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 uh, the deference in cases like Connick and the lower court cases to the public employer's managerial judgment are not just about the employers managing the workforce, it's about the employers managing the workforce to enable the effective, efficient delivery of public services. And the effective, efficient delivery of public services was clearly at issue uh, in Kennedy had the employer's counsel you know, emphasized that at least as much as the, the, the establishment clause concern. Oh yeah, I, I think there are ways. Yeah, I think there are ways that lower courts can get around it, uh, but it has certainly made life much more difficult for public employers in managing their workforces. Uh, and we all know that employers tend to be very paranoid about getting sued uh, in in workplace matters. Am I right, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> And public employers especially. So yeah, I, I, I think it's placed public employers in a very, very difficult position 
going forward and how they manage their workforces. Hmm. 